All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We are real excited. Uh, today's our, our, my first actual lesson of talking to uh, one of my brothers and friends in Christ about this issue of what I've entitled humanizing race. And as I shared in my opening message uh, about Jesus and the woman at the well, that what I want to do for the next several weeks is try to allow us to look at these conversations we're seeing right now around race and to try to hear some individual stories of people. And these are these are individuals that I know, some of which, like the one I'm going to talk to today, I've known since high school. And, um, and so these are people that I know and I trust, people who love the Lord. And I just want to be able to ask them a few questions. And I want us to be able to hear their experiences. And then we're going to talk about a Bible verse or two, some biblical principles. And the idea here is not to try to fix. It's not to try to judge. It's not to point fingers. It's just to try to listen to the perspective of, of a minority brother or sister, and then be able to say, God, what are you saying to me in this? Because I don't think we're going to learn a lot or change from CNN or Fox. Uh, I think we're going to change by meeting people, knowing people, being in relationship and hearing stories. And uh, we know God's always working to change us. So hopefully to that end, he'll do some work in our life. Today, uh, my first guest is going to be my good friend. We go all the way back to high school together. We walked uh, across campus at uh, Quincy Senior High School as freshmen. Uh, we had to walk across buildings together, and uh, we're together through high school and then in college. Uh, we sort of had a few years. We didn't communicate much, but then uh, when Bruce uh, really felt a call in his life in his 20s and after I had been called into ministry, we reconnected and had been very close for the last 25, almost 30 years, I would say 30 years, I guess now. And um, we've traveled to Africa together. We've uh, went to the Holy Land together. And I consider him a dear, dear friend. He's uh, preached to my churches, uh, both my churches in the past. I've had him there and I hope to have him here in, uh, in Phoenix at some point in time or in Sun City West. And uh, but you're going to love Bruce. Bruce is a, a wonderful man of God. Uh, he has uh, been in ministry now, pastoring a church in um, Plainfield area of, of Illinois for the last 10 years. He was a youth minister before that, an associate pastor. Uh, he's been married to his lovely wife, Madge, for 34 years. Madge, we went to school with as well. Uh, he has four boys, four great boys. I know all four of his boys. They're solid young men. They've been raised by Bruce, four grandkids. And uh, the other thing about Bruce, if you do not know, is that he was a phenomenal athlete. Um, could have picked his sport, literally, uh, but he played basketball, was a McDonald's All-America, one of the best uh, basketball players in the country in high school, was a uh, All-American in college, uh, was the Big Ten Player of the Year as a sophomore, and uh, would have been a lottery pick if he would have went, drafted that year, decided to stay with his teammates, try to win a national championship, ended up getting drafted by the Sacramento Kings, and then he had some knee injuries and uh, slowed him down a little bit. Uh, but God's been working through the whole process. So this is my friend, Bruce Douglas. Uh, Bruce, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Well, thanks, Jim. That's a great introduction. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. But um, no, I am uh, uh, doing well and so glad to be with you. And uh, definitely uh, you are not just a dear friend, but a, a brother that has helped mentor me and uh, uh, guide me through some, uh, some, some difficult times in growing in ministry. So uh, I'm glad I could be here with you this evening. First of all, tell me what you're encouraged about and what you're concerned about as you uh, observe everything taking place in our country and in the church. Well, let me start out by saying I, I'm encouraged, first of all, um, just about the, uh, the participation. You know, the Black Lives Movement uh, has, I think, um, helped create a, an environment where um, we're seeing people around the entire globe, uh, the world, uh, stand up against racism. So it's not just uh, in our nation. Um, and so I'm encouraged because what I see for the first time is people coming together to, uh, to try to recognize and identify some of the root causes uh, of what uh, the problem is around racism in our country. I think we've identified uh, the, a starting point, which I believe is to, is to review our history and to identify uh, that slavery was something that was evil. Uh, and I hope that um, we can uh, eradicate those things that represent that part of our history. Now, of course, it's been a great challenge because uh, we've unfortunately as a nation have allowed things to be erected and to be uh, honored and to, and to be um, glorified uh, that represent that people that really fought uh, to keep evil. And so I think now for the first time, we uh, as a nation are starting to, 
to come together and agree that we need to start to make some changes. And, and that excites me. Um, there's no question that um, when we talk about slavery, we, we're talking about people believing that they've been created superior or privileged or better than uh, someone of a different color. And uh, in our country, we know that that means Caucasians uh, are better than African Americans. And I'm glad and uh, encouraged that uh, right now, it looks like it has our attention and, uh, and we might be starting to make some steps forward. And what, what concerns you about what's taking place? Uh, left, right, well, up, down, what sort of, uh, what concerns you? Well, I think uh, my, my greatest concern is just the, the political climate of today. Um, we're living in a time where people have reached a place where they're no longer open for discussion. Uh, it's hard to rationalize or reason or come to a, uh, an agreement or a standard of truth or, or, or expectation that we all can achieve. Uh, we're just living in a time where it's very troubling. Uh, the most troubling thing about today is the church. Um, as the people of God that have been called by Christ uh, to carry out the mission uh, to seek that which is lost, uh, we seem to be focused on our self-interest, uh, on our self-value, and uh, on our own self uh, futures uh, being economically uh, well off. And, uh, and that just seems to be alarming because we should be leading the charge and standing up against the evils of the day that we might be able to impact our culture. So yeah. uh, that, that concerns me where, where we're at as a church and, and as a nation. You know, we were talking a couple times the last, last couple of months during the pandemic about how, you know, COVID is another layer of this, but with COVID, everything taking place, how Christians, you know, in history, you look at 1918, you go back to even the Roman Empire when they had a couple of plagues that hit Rome, and the Christians were on the front line. They were serving. They were taking care of dead bodies. They were doing the burials when the pagans were running away. Uh, one of the greatest uh, physicians in the history of Roman uh, literature, Roman history, was a guy named Galen, who uh, is still written about today. He went and withdrew himself from the community for a year, year and a half while the plague was taking place. Christians were serving. And yet today it seems like rather than being on the front line saying, how can we serve people? How can we help people? The church is sort of withdrawn and uh, we're more concerned about our rights than we are really about everybody else. Uh, and I think that's emblematic of what you're saying, even with the race conversation. It's about how do I protect myself as opposed to serve, listen, how do I try to, you know, uh, to model Christ putting others first? Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you on, you know, the, the whole ideal about putting others before yourself, uh, treating others the way you want to be treated. And uh, it, it just, there's something spiritually lacking, uh, not just in the church, but in our leadership in the church. And, and I'm praying that, you know, that as this pandemic and as this racism, as these things are brought to the forefront, that God might once again get our attention and through the power of his spirit, we might unify and uh, stand together so we can take down this evil. So what I'd like you to do is take a few moments and share maybe just a couple of stories about yourself that you've experienced. And, um, and I think it's also important to note that you've experienced things even as a professional athlete that was one of the top high school, one of the top college basketball players in the entire country, played in the NBA, um, and yet you still encountered situations. So why don't you share a few of your stories about that? Well, sure. Um, first of all, you know, just growing up in the climate of racism, uh, from the perspective of, I grew up in a small town on, on the river, a uh, great community, uh, a lot of good people, but uh, even growing up from my younger days, uh, I had friends that I played with every day, um, but was never allowed to come into their house. Uh, I would, you know, they were allowed to come into my house and we would play all day long. And if, when it was time to get a drink of water, they would run to the house and get a drink of water and I would just wait outside. And, and they would come back and tell me that, you know, my mom and dad doesn't allow colored people in the house. And, um, and so that was from an early age. And, and of course, I went to a black school, a Jackson school, because my mother was a teacher there. And it was uh, predominantly black. And uh, when I got into the first grade at the end of the, that school year, they closed that school because it had too many blacks. And they bust us to other areas uh, in the community. And I happened to go to a school that I lived in a district, a school that was across the street. And there was literally seven black kids in the school. Uh, and, um, and so being called the N-word growing up was pretty routine. 
uh, and then and then playing with those same kids, you know, later in the day. And so you grow up with this kind of mindset that these are how things are, and and we're raised to kind of deal with them. And so as I get older and become you know, more popular in sports, uh, it does give you some access to other things. I had great white families that supported me. Uh, they did a lot of good things for me. Um, I could, they would take me to dinner. They would help support me going to camps, but there was limitations. I mean, they did, they made it clear that I was not to date their daughters. Um, I was not to try to co or intermingle into a way where we might be considered family. Uh, we could be great, uh, have a great, agreement, a great friendship, as long as it had those limitations. And so, you know, you grow up understanding that. Um, there was places that you didn't go to. Um, there were certain people that when they came, you had to leave. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, as I, Of course, being a, an athlete gave me access to a lot of things. And as I got older, at the height of my popularity, I was just the Big Ten Player of the Year. Uh, we were in the regional championship. Uh, literally three weeks after that, I was stopped in Chicago, um, thrown out on the street. Me and Ephraim Winters was driving down the street, um, thrown, pulled over, thrown out at gunpoint, searched, car ransacked, and then told that we fit the description of two black men that robbed a tavern around the corner, 6'9 and 6'4. If you couldn't have looked at us and knew right away that we either fit a description or we didn't, and so, you know, you have these kind of uh, things that happen to you uh, in your, in your life, from your childhood to your adulthood. Uh, and, and so they, they do kind of frame your thinking. Um, and then finally, I don't want to miss out just uh, that as you grow up as a parent, I, I had kids that were cut from a basketball team uh, in, in a junior year who had been a starter on a sophomore team and, uh, in lieu of players that had never even played. Uh, you know, a son that was cut from a baseball team and was the best player on the team. And these are in the, this, this is in the 90s in high schools and college. I mean, in, in pr prominent high schools. So it, it's something that still goes on today. And uh, to clarify both of those stories of your sons that you went, you had moved to the suburbs of Plain, uh, you know, the community you were at. <laughs> and so your, your, uh, when Bruce Jr. Uh, was, was cut, he was the only black kid on the team or was. Yes, you know, and, and, and so Downers Grove North High School, I have no problem saying it's a prominent high school. It's, it's a, Bruce was a two-sport athlete there. He played his junior year on the football team. They won the state championship, and he came out late like all the football players did. Um, Bruce started his sophomore year, his freshman year on the basketball team. His junior year, they cut him. And, uh, you know, for the light of me, I couldn't – I asked the coach, you know, he had kept three players – that had been on the eighth grade team, the ninth grade team, and the 10th grade team, and had never played a minute. They were just fans. And uh, in lieu of Bruce, he cut them. And I asked him why, and he told me, you know, he didn't think he wanted to play. And I, and I thought, or, or, you know, but the real issue is this uh, uh, systemic structures of racism that exist lead us to believe that it's important that we protect the white child and allow his experience to be fulfilled at the cost of not even being concerned of how it will impact the black child. Now, of course, Bruce was very popular. So it was a very, very uh, uh, delicate time in his life. And uh, it took a whole lot of grace from God and, and his relationship with Christ just to come back to the team. Because of course, the coach, after we had a meeting with the athletic director, um, you know, uh, they begged him to come back and he did come back. Uh, but the thing is, is that those kind of experiences at a young age uh, can tra have a traumatic experience where some, the average African-American teenager will not survive that. Uh, Bruce came from a solid home. He had a, a solid relationship with Christ, a great foundation, and it still had things that troubled him. We, we spent a lot of time talking through that. And so, yeah, those things are difficult that we have people in our school systems in leadership uh, that, that have no kind of um, understanding of what racism really looks like. Yeah, and I think to that point, you know, one of the things that I've heard uh, several people say that, uh, you know, when I saw what happened with George Floyd, it was, I mean, it's just, it was gut-wrenching. I mean, it just brings tears to your eyes. I can't believe that that literally happened, you know, on the street and that someone's filming this, this guy does this. But the difference is, is I've had several 
uh, people I've heard, people that I know and don't know uh, that have said, when I saw George Floyd, I saw myself or I saw my son because as a black American, you identify with that. And when you talked about the fact that there is that, that one of the subtle ways that racism still is alive and well in America, because I think a lot of white Americans, Bruce, they see, they look at explicit racism and they say, well, it's not as bad as it was. And so because explicit racism, the Jim Crow laws, these kind of things are not what they were that they don't think is a problem. But what you see and what many black Americans see is the implicit racism. It's the smaller subtle things that are not as, 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 as easy to identify. They're more subtle, but yet when you piece them together, it's pretty easy to see there's things behind that. It's the, 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 the thing that's hard to, for, for me to understand is that these are the same things that were happening when I was growing up. And so when I talk to my, uh, my friends that are Caucasian and we talk about these things, they, were, they, they seem to not be privy to the fact that these things happened 50 years ago and they're still happening today. And so, like you said, it's the subtle things, but it's that sy systematic or stomatic way and structures that have been in place and that have never, ever been torn down or even questioned. We still have a lot of these things going on. And so we have got to continue to build relationships with our brothers and sisters, uh, uh, our Cauc Caucasian brothers and sisters, that they might be able to experience us. And, and like the young people say, they, they might feel us. Yeah. When I was, uh, we both raised, as we said, we were raised in the same town. I remember it was in the 90s when uh, you were in Chicago and, um, and uh, Steph and I came up to stay with you to visit for a while. I remember we were talking, you mentioned something about Quincy, you know, being you know, like sort of a racism you encountered in Quincy. I'm like, Quincy really isn't racist, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, you know, and, and then I remember you, you know, I've talked about this. When I moved to Peoria and got out of Quincy and I actually left the city and went to a, a larger, more diverse community. And when I came back, you see things differently. You see like, boy, we have this section of town, this town of 40,000 people, but all the black people basically live in one specific area. And like you said, when we, I remember specifically third grade when they, when they segregated the schools in Peoria, you know, they shut down Jackson, but what did they do? They bust all the black kids out to the white schools, but none of the white kids go to where the, the black school was. And those are things you, you look back in retrospect and I, and I see more of those things now, but at the time I couldn't see them. Um, you know, even, even when you're, you're trying to say, well, I'm not sure I really agree with you on that, but it takes experience. It takes openness and conversation to really begin to see there are some of these things taking place that I, I just can't see, even though they're right in front of me, I have to sometimes step back and I have to put on a different set of glasses. Yeah. I think you, you really do have to, to kind of get into a different environment. Uh, you have to interact in different places so that you can really go back and see what's going on. And if you've been there your whole life, you will think, hey, everything is peachy keen. Everybody gets equal opportunity. But, you know, these are just the, uh, we're talking about the, the experiences from just families and parenting, not, not in, including the workplace, the opportunities that, uh, you know, we've seen, I've experienced where people have been given jobs that are not half as qualified, haven't worked half as hard. And then you go and look around and you find out that everybody above you is family. They're all related. They're, they're, they're cousins and their uh, aunts and uncles. And, and then they tell you, oh, yeah, well, no, we don't do nepotism anymore. Now that all their families are in place that, uh, we, you know, we can't bring any of our people in now that we've gotten to a place where there's opportunity. So a lot of these things happen. And, uh, and, and we understand, um, I do, that uh, there is this, uh, uh, ideal that there is a lot of good white people. Jim, I have, I could not be who I am. I could not have accomplished what I did without a lot of great white people that are, were supporting me, that were close friends to me, that encouraged me. Um, but being good does not mean that you don't have racist ideals or, or racist thoughts. And so um, uh, even in the midst of that, um, the racism still consists and exists uh, and it's alive because we think because we're doing something good for someone that um, they should be thankful uh, wow. instead of, you know, that's the way it should be because we're created equal. They, uh, we also, I think a lot of white, white people believe that racism is hatred towards another race or another group of people. And I don't think racism is always hatred. Sometimes it's indifferent. Sometimes it's these subtle things that we hold in place. But that's why a lot of people say, well, I don't have a racist bone in my body because they don't feel like they intentionally hate or doing things malicious. But that doesn't mean that they don't still have uh, subconscious biases and tensions.
we, the, the, I think we become acclimated to where we expect those things. We expect, I, I, I was out, and now look, this is current stuff. I, I can be out with someone now um, that, uh, you know, that I'm over uh, in a workplace or anything. And I mean, I've been out many times uh, with other people. And uh, when we show up, it'll be a Caucasian and myself. And the first thing they'll do is start talking to the Caucasian like he's in charge. <laughs> and, and and the Caucasian will tell him, oh no, he's the one that's in charge. <laughs> you know, this is a, the, the 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 man that you want to talk to. So when we show up together, it is just assumed that the Caucasian is going to be the one who's leading it or who's in charge of it. And so um, so these things are are just things that we have, you know, we've got to overcome and we've got to encourage one another that we we are equal. We've been given uh, the same abilities and uh, given the same opportunities. We will be able to accomplish the same thing. Yes. So where do you, uh, just to shift a little bit, where do you, where do you see God at work in all this? What do you, what do you sense the Lord, the Holy Spirit's doing in the midst of this, uh, this uh, season of time? You know, I, I think that I'm really, for me, uh, up in this area, I think we're seeing a, a much more of a movement with young people. Uh, I, I think that young people uh, especially um, in the church, are starting uh, to question things. Uh, the Black Lives Movement has been very beneficial in, in the context of the Black church, uh, and I think the church in general, because what it is causing is not just for young people to be more involved, but they are looking to the scriptures for answers. And as they look to the scriptures, I'm seeing young people uh, throughout the church question the leadership. In other words, they are questioning how are we being so quiet in a time when things are so turbulent, when racism is, is at the height, uh, economics and pandemics, and, and we're not hearing from the church. And I think for the first time, I'm seeing young people who's questioning me, who's challenging me that, that, that they want to make a difference in the world uh, the way that God called the church to impact the world. And so for me, I'm seeing these young people uh, challenging us leaders to, to get out of our books and out of our theology and get ourselves back in the streets and back in relationship and back in the center of society uh, where God called us to make a difference. And so uh, up here, we're starting to see a lot more young people get involved uh, and bring life to the church. And that's even in the black churches. They're pushing the black leadership of the black churches, what you're saying. Exactly. Uh, we, let me tell you this. When we talk about racism, it's not just a, a white issue in the context of, of what they don't understand. It's also a black issue in the context of what we need to be doing. There's things that we need to do uh, as we unify, as we get more involved, as we vote, as we, um, as we continue to encourage Christian people to be involved in, in the po politics and the economics. Um, they're, they're, God has called us to make a difference and we cannot retreat and use racism as, a, as an excuse to be irresponsible. Uh, we cannot be irresponsible. Uh, God has called us, that's one of my scriptures, to be overcomers. Um, and, and you can't be an overcomer if there's not something to overcome. And I think the young people have once again brought to the light that throughout the history of the church, uh, in, in the lives of many black people in the Bible, God has always given us the strength to overcome. And so this is not a time for us to lay back and to point the finger and to lay blame. Uh, it's time uh, for us to be called to action, uh, to become doers of the word. One of the things that I would challenge all of my Christian uh, white brothers and sisters to, to, to do uh, is to move away from this place of white guilt. Uh, I, I don't want any of my white uh, friends uh, calling me uh, and apologizing to me from guilt. Let me tell you, I counsel a lot of married couples, and one of the things I do when a, a spouse has done something wrong in the relationship is the first thing I do is tell him that we've got to get you free of the guilt. You've got to deal with your issues and repent of those issues so you can be set free from the guilt. Because as long as we operate under guilt in this racism, it will be this issue that we'll always be able to say what happened yesterday. And, you'll, and you will, will operate from guilt. When you get free, you operate from morality and love. And now all of a sudden, guilt forces you to do it. Love motivates you because you want to do it. And what we need is for our white brothers and sisters to want to do it. We don't want you to feel guilty about doing it. We want you to be free to love us 
in doing it. And so that's uh, that's where we're at today. We're at this place where what we want to do is love one another. We don't want to force you to do something that you've been doing for the last 200 years that won't change nothing for another 200 years. Please set yourself free from your racial issues. Don't operate out of this guilt, but operate from a position of, of morality and love. That's, that's beautiful. I think about the verse you're saying that, Bruce. Mine goes where Jesus said, um, you know, he said, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. The one who is forgiven little loves little. And so if we don't think we have much to be forgiven of or there's no humility in our life, it's very hard for us to love. But, but like you said, sometimes we, uh, even we do hear the message of grace or forgiveness, like we can't forgive ourselves. And then when you have guilt, that guilt feeds shame. And then, and then so what happens is that people either wallow in that and they're afraid to move forward or else what happens is if they have guilt and they can't identify it or they feel like they're being, being blamed, then they become very defensive. They go into attack mode. Because, yeah. you know, if I feel like you're attacking me when you bring up an issue and I take it very personally, even though you're not talking to me, you're talking about in generalities, then people become very aggressive, very, very defensive. And I would say from my perspective, I appreciate it's so beautiful about guilt because I do think it's a, a barrier we have to overcome. And, um, and I would also say that I think this idea of we have to try, white people have to try really hard not to be so defensive. We have to try really hard to listen and not think that you're talking about me necessarily every time you bring something up, you're talking in general terms. But when we internalize that, you know, then that's when we become very defensive and then we don't hear and then we want to attack. Yeah, black people, and, and, and I hope my Caucasian brothers and sisters understand this, black people are not against white people. Black people are against racism. Uh, it's not a black uh, white that we hate. It's black and racism. We are against racism, and uh, and and that's the issue. And I, I think that uh, today you're so on target, Jim, uh, with your uh, with the Caucasian, our brothers and sisters. I got plenty of good friends uh, like you uh, that that uh, that I have great conversations with that um that share their perspective, and we just get we have got to get to know one another better. We've got to be able to feel each other better. We've got to be able to be open and honest with each other. Uh, we realize that years and years of uh, racism has impacted uh, the, our Caucasian brothers and sisters the same way as it impacted uh, the Blacks uh, in, in this country. We, it's created a certain way of thinking uh, that we have got to overcome, and, and we have to do that together. It, it's not a a one-sided thing. What's uh, are there any specific scriptures that are alive in you right now as you think about what we're going through and and uh, what you know you talked about what you felt like God's doing, which was beautiful. Is there, are there any scriptures that are just really alive inside of you that you just feel like really is a word a word right now that uh, is alive in you, or you feel for other people in general? Well, I know it says the the, the, the men of Issachar understood the times of their day of their generation. Uh, then in Acts, it tells us that David was a man that served uh, God's purposes in his generation. I, I think we're, you know, the, the scriptures are moving me to, to look at the word and find people uh, that were in tune with their generation, with the times. We need, and I, that's why the young people have excited me, because we are looking for people that understand the times we're in and understand that this will require more than human effort. It will require more than uh, the, the status quo in, in politics. This is going to require a transformation uh, through the power of God's spirit uh, as the truth of his word sets us free. And, uh, and, and so I look at the book of Galatians and we see Paul confronting Peter. I, we like to talk about uh, you know, my favorite verse, uh, Galatians 2 and 20, where Paul says, it's no longer I that live, uh, uh, but I've died. And now uh, the life that I live, I live by faith in, in the God who died for me and loves me. And, and, and so he says all these things and we, we focus on that scripture, but we miss what happened that led him to that scripture was a racial uh, discrimination or a, a racial uh, interaction where Peter, who had been fellowshipping with his brothers uh, of another color um, and had, had, had grown in relationships with them, saw his white brothers show up or his Caucasian Jewish brothers at that time show up. And then he retreated uh, from the relationships he had built, from the food he had been eating, from all the things he had picked up. And, and he separated himself and Paul called him out. And I want you to know today that most of our uh, white, uh, that we have a lot of white people that are not racist. Uh, the problem is, is that the, 
the systemic systems and structures that are in place uh, are in place because not because they're racist, but because they have not stood up against the racism. They haven't called it out. Paul called Peter out and said, Peter, you either going to be a Christian or you're not. You're not going to be able to be a Christian on Sunday and then live a racist life Monday through Saturday. And, and I think today that um, as I look out, I just encourage our, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, when they see something that's not right, stand up against it. Hold people accountable for it. Uh, the church calls us to do that. And, uh, and I think if, if we can look at the scriptures and we can identify with the people of Issachar, the, the, the men of Issachar, the, if we can let God give us revelation of how to build relationships uh, with one another, um, we will see the power of Christ uh, alive in our society, in, in the very structures that we've established uh, that need to be torn down. When people talk about what well, is white folks being complicit, sometimes there, there is that overt racism that we see and we experience but we don't speak up or speak out because we don't want them to, you know, we just sort of let, like just, just let it go. And I think that's where we are. That's one of the things I see is that, that we need to be able to speak up and we need to be able to address things because, you know, I saw a guy on ESPN and um, Ocho, I think his name was, he was a, a commentator, former football player. But I remember when this whole thing came down the first week after um, uh, the, the, the death in Minneapolis, I remember he said, we, he says, I need my white friends to step up. I, we cannot do this without your help. Yes. And, um, you know, and it really struck me. It really pulled a cord because it is a situation where I've got to, I've got to listen. I've got to learn. I've got to deal with my own stuff about the things that I have in my life. But then when there is opportunity, I don't, I don't need to go looking for stuff. We don't have to go looking for it. We just have to live and we're going to, it's going to come to us. If we see it every day, we, we deal with it every day. And, and, and when we make a decision um, to stand up or to speak out against it, when we see it, that is, that's, that's the subtle changes we need to start happening. Uh, it, it needs to not just happen in society. It needs to happen in the church. We, we need to, to speak out against things uh, in the church that are going on. There is just too, too many things that don't line up with scripture. There's too many, uh, too many things being said that are offensive to uh, the black brothers and sisters uh, of the faith. Uh, there's too many things that, um, that are dividing us um, because we're just not speaking out. And I hate to say, it, but I agree that the majority of the people uh, are, are with us, uh, that, they're, that they, they, they don't just stand with us, they believe it, uh, but they just haven't found the courage to say something about it. And, and that's what we have to pray for, is it, just the courage to do it. That's awesome. Man, thank you so much for your time. Any, I'll give you any closing words you want to share about anything you feel like, anything else you want to say to wrap up things uh, you feel like you want people to know, feel like you, you suggestions you want us to do, or just in general, uh, you, you know, take a few minutes here, several minutes, and just uh, any closing thoughts you have before we wrap up. You know, probably on the, the, the final thing that I would, would probably say I, I, I would, would want our Christian, white Christian brothers and sisters to know is that Black Lives Matter. You know, um, I only say that because all lives matter is not the proper response right now. It, it, it's no different than when we say the unborn life matters. We don't, when, when we say that it matters, no one says all lives matter. We realize that this is a specific purpose uh, for a specific cause, that there is an injustice being done to babies in the womb. And when that happens, we don't say all lives matter. We focus in on that one specific issue. And so the emphasis, not the entity of Black Lives Matter is important. The emphasis is that, listen, lives are being taken. And right now, we need to have a focus uh, so that we can zero in on stopping this from happening. I've got four boys. And I want you to know that when they come around the table, I care about all of them. All their lives matter. But when Brock was six, he got nephrotic syndrome. And it changed the way we did things uh, for him. We zeroed in on his issue because it was specific. And the pain that he felt, we empathized with him. And because we did that, um, it didn't mean our other kids' lives didn't matter. It just meant that the emphasis was on his specific purpose at that specific time because it was to help him get through what he had to go through. And so when we talk Black Lives Matter, it is the same issue. 
the emphasis is on knowing that there's something wrong when we can see black men and women being shot down and uh, we can uh, watch white people shoot up theaters, shoot up schools and come out without a scratch on them. Uh, so there is a difference in what's going on. And so when we say that, I just want our brothers and sisters to know of the Caucasian flavor, that we say that not because all lives don't matter, but because at this specific time and for this specific purpose, black lives must be the focus on what matters. So uh, Jim, that's really how I want to close it. I do want to just uh, thank you for for taking the time, man, to, to for all the things you do. I love you. You're not just my brother in Christ. You're, you're, you're a mentor. You're a man of the kingdom, a, a leader uh, that, um, that all people can learn from. And uh, I know that God has, a, 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 has your heart in his hand on this issue of racism. And, and I'm just glad that um, I've got a brother like you to, to, to stand with and to champion this, this cause. I know that God is going to, is going to give us the victory. Uh, we're going to get the experience in my day and time. I'm praying for that. Uh, but until then, we're going to continue to live by faith. That's excellent. One final word on the, the Black Lives Matter, because, you know, when that was at 2013, whenever it you know, started, the movement started, you know, my initial reaction was a little bit defensive that like yourself, my initial reaction was, well, all lives matter. But it took me a while to really understand what was being said. And I think uh, to, to your point about, you know, I think every, and I use the word every, every African American, every black person I've ever talked to that's used that says, well, obviously all lives matter. It's not saying that, well, you know, we're more important or better. It's like, but we feel like these things we're facing are such to where it's a point of emphasis. And at that point, Bruce, you know, I wrote a book that, you know, isn't really much worth the paper it's put on, but at least I wrote one, right? And I entitled it Dirt Matters based upon the parable of the sower. I have not had anybody say to me, yeah, but Jim, you know, water matters and fertilizer matters. Now it's a given. Yes, you know, you can't, you have to have water, you have to have fertilizer, you have to have sunlight. But the purpose of my book was to talk about the purpose of soil and how soil plays a part in God bringing forth growth. And, um, and, and the same way here, we're saying, yes, these other things, all lives matter. Um, you don't have to be anti-police to say black lives matter. What we're saying, though, is that that for this season right now, there's a, injustices that are things taking place. We're emphasizing this, and and I think that is important because I do see more uh, of uh, more people starting to understand that. But it has been hard for them to understand because, just like myself, the re initial reaction of many white folks yeah. is, saying, "Are you saying your lives are better than mine, or our lives don't matter?" And I really appreciate you emphasizing that's not at all what you're saying. Nor are you endorsing the agenda or of the organization itself. Right. That has stuff exactly. that's, that's the entity and we need to you know the entity you got to research that uh, we're not ours is on the emphasis not the entity and i think that can be confusing sometimes because the entity requires research to, to see what that's all about the emphasis is just the specific point and purpose we're trying to we're trying to identify all right well bless you my friend love you and love madge tell her i said hey and the kids and uh why don't you close us in prayer and uh appreciate you everything all right your will. Father, we thank you for uh, this wonderful day that you made. We thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to have a conversation about your creation, about your purpose uh, for each and every man, woman, boy, and child born into this world. We pray right now, Lord, that this uh, conversation would be used to enlighten minds, uh, to free up hearts, uh, that they might understand that we're not just created equal, but you have created us to love one another, to support one another, and to encourage one another to be all that you said we should be. Uh, I thank you for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of, of the greatest nation in the world, which is America. And I pray, Lord, right now uh, that you would use uh, Jim's vision for uh, these messages to, uh, to, to encourage uh, to enlighten, uh, to empower uh, not just our Caucasian brothers, but our Black brothers and sisters as well to become free, to forgive one another, to love one another, to build relationships with one another, uh, that we might make a difference in this country that we live. Now, Lord, bless uh, our, our politics, our president, 
Bless, Lord, us with this spirit of unity and let us try to live in peace with one another in the days to come. But we pray for each and every person uh, that has been a victim of racism. We pray, Lord, that you would give them a peace uh, to understand that your purpose is being, uh, being revealed uh, in the midst of the struggle that we might become all that you said we should be. Uh, now we pray all of this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Well, God bless you, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hook up with you later. Yeah, Jim. Bless you, man. Love you. Thanks. All righty.